So coming to zero hour, in fact today is, the world is on the verge of an unprecedented digital and knowledge revolution. When I say unprecedented, you'll soon understand what I mean by the word unprecedented. Today we are flooded with mountains of data, and data to become knowledge has to cover a long distance. Data has to be curated to become information. Information has to be culled and polished to become knowledge. And finally, knowledge, when it gets universally applied, it becomes wisdom. So today we are trying to make use, make sense out of the huge volumes of data that keep churning every second, every billionth of a second, every trillionth of a second. That is the speed at which data are coming today. Computers of tomorrow, why tomorrow even today, can do and will do much better than we human beings can ever do when it comes to knowledge-based operations. Look for not very far, look in the next five to 10 years, things will change. Things are happening even today, you don't have to wait for five to 10 years. You know, today you have apps, many of these apps are becoming so disruptive, trying to disrupt industry, trying to disrupt technology. Today, many of you would have come here not using your own car, but taking Uber. Uber is the world's largest taxi service. But then, you would think that Uber has the largest number of taxis in the world. Totally wrong. Uber has not even a single car of its own. Uber is only a software, software tool provider. Without having a single taxi owned by Uber, it has become the largest taxi operator in the world. Airbnb, which is also the world's biggest hotel company. You would think Airbnb must be owning a chain of hotels. Again, wrong. Airbnb does not even have a single hotel anywhere in the world. Not even a single dollar worth of property. Yet, it is the world's biggest hotel chain in the world. All making use of the knowledge. Knowledge coming from after culling the data into information and becoming knowledge. You know, many of you would have watched the famous, at least I watched once in a while, the famous American TV reality show, Shark Tanks. Shark Tank is nothing but a, a show where aspiring inter entrepreneurs from around the world, they, they just pitch in their innovations, their, their, their business model to a panel of billionaires with the hope that they will be able to persuade them to fund their own investment, their own ideas. And one such Shark Tank is a very famous individual known as Chris Saka. And Chris Saka used to work for Google, used to work for many other company. He decided to resign from Google and he became a Shark Tank, started investing. And he was invested in Uber when Uber was just about to start. Why? He knew the value of Uber. He has invested in Airbnb knowing the value of Airbnb. So that's where a great thinker and a great innovator can think ahead of time. We need to think ahead of our time. And Shark Tank, the Shark, Chris Saka has predicted that in the next couple of years, people will not like to own their cars. Why? Because tomorrow, the day will come. You will just call a car from your iPhone, I watch, I need a car. Siri, get me a car. I need to go to Pragati Madan. Car will come, it will announce you, sir, car is going to on its way, it will reach in 20 seconds. Because somewhere there is a car moving around, it will catch the car and tell you, you go and see, because I am calling from this location, GRPS will tell them, this is where the car is needed. And this car will then take you to the place that you are driving, that you want to go, so you don't have to worry about driving, you don't have to worry about what kind of a car it would be, it will be a state of the art car, you don't have to worry about where to park. The car will be doing the next job. And you don't have to pay a fortune. You'll only have to pay the distance. And today Uber is the cheapest vehicle on the road today, transport on the road. It costs you less than a three-wheeler. And in fact, people have predicted that with this call a car, accident rate will fall from one every 60,000 miles in the world 
to about one every six million miles. Look at the number of accidents it will come down to. This is not enough. Tomorrow we'll have autonomous self-driven car, which is now sending jitters to big manufacturers such as Mercedes, Volkswagen, Volvo, and Audi, and many others. What is autonomous self-driven car? There's no driver. And the first autonomous self-driven car is expected to be in the market by 2020. Trials have already been going on. And what this self-driven car will do, autonomous car will do, it will just have to call on your CD or whatever on your smartphone, the car will come. No driver, you just feed in your smartphone, this is where I want to go, it will take you to the place. That is where technology is moving. This is already a reality. Tesla is coming up with its first autonomous car. And that is sending jitters to traditional car manufacturers. So the cars for tomorrow will have hardware given by Volkswagen and Mercedes, but the software, the heart of the car, would be given by Apple, Google, Amazon, and such software providers. And these cars will run, will be very, very cheap because they will run on electricity. They will be very clean. There will be no pollution, literally. Why? And not to, not, not electricity, but electricity from the grid. Next generation of iPhone iX, which is called iPhone 10, will be charged without plugging it to an electrical, electrical outlet. You just put it on a platform, it will be charged. The next generation of autonomous cars will have a similar kind of a technology where you don't have to put in a platform, you don't have to plug in anywhere, it will charge on its own. There will be solar power, also be solar powered cars, and solar powered cars will require much less energy, will be completely pollution free. And this is happening. Solar energy consumption has increased logarithmically, literally. Why? Because solar efficiency, solar cell efficiency has increased. When I wanted to get a solar cell for my own house, the efficiency was 11%, and today it is crossed 30%. And people are predicting that we are almost 100% efficient in the next five to 10 years. So that, if that efficiency is there, why do you need to have anything from the grid? In fact, the U, in the US, the, the fossil oil lobby is making every effort to prevent the solar power, the households on solar power generated to be fed to the national grid. Because there are so many people using solar power. You know, another thing which is happening today is nothing but known as a 3D printer based technology. What is 3D print printer? 3D printer means you are printing things not in two dimensions, but in three in the third dimension. And what do you do in the third dimension? You just put in whatever you want to do, give the soft give the all third dimensions, and the computer will print out. In IT Delhi, where I work for, where I am professor, we have 3D printing. In fact, the first machine that we are now testing for tuberculosis detection has been 3D printed. 3D printing costs printers are very expensive. But let me tell you, technology moves and follows the Moore's law, which means as technology proceeds, the cost will come down. The cost of 3D printers have collapsed from $18,000, bare minimum one, to $400. And 3D printers are now used everywhere. There are, there are 3D pattern recognition and softwares. My Apple phone tomorrow will have a 3D image recognition. So in fact, all I have to do is to take my iPhone, my iPhone, just show it around my, my shoes. It will tell me the complete contours of my, of my toe. And then I feed those contours into the 3D printer. It will come out with a 3D printed, in-house printed 3D shoe, in-house made 3D shoe. Then I don't have to go to the, to the market to buy a shoe. You will be surprised. But the fact is, most of the world's leading shoe manufacturers are printing shoe by 3D, are making shoes by 3D printing. They are not asking a cobbler to make it. It's being made by 3D printing. Not only that, 3D can be also used to make a building. One of the first building made by 3D printing is a six-story building in China. Six-story building made not by conventional methods of brick and mortar and steel, but by 3D printing. That is the power of technology that's going on. This is fine, but how are our individual lives, how will they be affected? Our individual lives will also be affected in a manner unprecedented. In fact, 
We are today talking about the big data. Go to the US, go to Europe, go to Germany. Everybody is putting effort on big data. There are programs on big data. And big data, believe it or not, the bulk of the space of the big data will be occupied by developments and requirements of the human biology, the human health, and of course, the plant and animal health as well. The big data and the analytic tools that are used to make, make business make sense out of the big data are all expanding in a big way. Today, we all think that whatever I am, 50% of that is coming from my father, 50% is my mother. That's true, we all think we are born, my father and mother have contributed half of the genes and that's what makes me what I am. Is it true or false? Anybody from the audience? True? I would say you are partly correct. So don't be shocked. It doesn't mean anything else. It simply means that there are factors other than your own human genes which contribute to what we are today. And what are these factors? Advances in biology, advances in medicine have revealed that these factors are nothing but microbes that sit in our body. We have been knowing from time immemorial, whenever a doctor gives you an antibiotic, he also tells you, probiotic Why is he asking you to take probiotic? Because when you take an antibiotic, it will also affect the flora, bacterial flora that lives in our gut. You don't want that flora to disappear completely, so you want to replenish it by taking a fresh flora. And this is what is known as a microbiome. In fact, we have more genes in our body coming from these microbiomes than those given by my father and my mother. That are now these microbiomes in turn modulate, play with, and interact with the human gene and can, take, can turn the fate of this human gene completely different from what it was designed to be playing a role. Look at the complexity. So this host microbe interaction, and imagine the variables are running into hundreds of thousands. So with hundreds of thousands of variables, interaction is going to be much, much more than big data can even think of. That is where, and today it's getting very clear, that microbes can provide solution to everything. You can treat cancer by using microbiome. You can treat genetic disorders by using microbiome. You, have, you can treat infectious disease by using microbiome. So in fact, tomorrow, and that tomorrow may not be literally next week or, or, or month, no, but in the next couple of years time, if you go to the doctor, he's not going to give you any antibiotic or a drug. He'll say, take that culture of bacteria. That is your medicine. But then that culture of bacteria will, will interact with your human genome and then bring about a change. Unbelievable. This is happening. That is where we are looking at the zero hour today. Even disease diagnosis. Today, we, want, we are suffering from a disease. The doctor tells us, Test chronology, go and get a chikungunya test, get a dengue test, and then I go back and say, sir, dengue is negative, chikungunya is negative. Okay, then it could be a viral flu, so don't have to worry. So essentially, all the diagnosis today is by elimination. You eliminate dengue, okay, dengue is not there. Eliminate chikungunya, chikungunya is not there. Eliminate uh, other virus, it's not there. But tomorrow's diagnosis will be by affirmation, will be predictive. I'll predict that this is what you have. In fact, the world's first such machine is going to be launched before the end of this year. It will be called Tricoder X on the lines of what you saw in the space shift, the spacecraft. And this machine, all you have to do is to simply cuff it out through your breath, maybe with a small flick of your, of your fingertip. That's all, and wait for a few minutes. And the machine has in it inbuilt markers, which will scan all your genome and say, okay, and say, oh my God, you are going to have dengue tomorrow, or dengue is already there with you, or you are going to have cancer, which is going to develop in, in the next three months from you, from now. All this is going to be possible. This is where technology is moving. And all this uses wisdom, but before that, knowledge. And soon this will become wisdom. Today it's possible to make corrections before the child is born in its DNA. I know the one mother is hemophilic, father is also carrier, chances of a baby being hemophilic is very high. 
I want to chip that disease. I don't want my baby to be hemophilic. So I asked the doctor, doctor, please edit my baby's genome. Before the baby is born, my wife is pregnant, and I want to check that my, my daughter or son, it will be the daughter who will be carried, will, it does not become hemophilic. And so for that, while the, before the baby is born, corrections can be made in utero. If for some reason it could not be made in utero, even when the baby is born, it can be made at that time also. This is already happening. Not in India, but in the West. And soon it will happen, very soon. How will all these developments impact the human society, the society we live? My feeling is it will impact the society in a very big way. Again, unprecedented way. So truly we are at ground zero. Let me give you some examples. With surrogacy becoming common, a law become going to be enforced very soon, guidelines have already been put up. We are going to question the very basic foundation of human society. What's the basic foundation of human society? Mother is a mother, is a fact. I know she is my mother because people saw me being delivered by my mother. My father is my father is a belief. My mother told me that so and so is your father. So I respect him because he's my father. Nobody has seen it. Which means mother is a mother is a fact. Father is a father is a belief. Even this very basic foundation of society is being questioned now. You have surrogate mother. You have biological mother. You have legal mother. And now you can have a single child born by contributions of two mothers. So who would you call the real mother? Both have contributed their DNA. That's where technology is moving. Not only there, we all know that father is required to produce a baby. So for procreation, you need a sexual activity. It's essential. Without father, you cannot have a baby. That's all of the past. Today, you can have a baby without having a father. You can have a baby exactly replicating you by cloning your own DNA and making your own self as a, your own baby. Where is technology leading us to? What kind of institution will be living in the world of tomorrow? This is where we are going to be questioning even the very institution of marriage. Institution of marriage will take a big beating. It will no longer be for procreation. It will be for purely satisfying your sexual needs or doing some other contractual jobs. The question of vegetarianism. Today we say, I will not take anything which has to do with animal products or animal meat. That's where it is vegetarian. But today people are now making veal. Veal is nothing but a very tender meat of a, of a uh, cattle. Today you can get tender, that's going to be in the market very soon in the US. A tender veal made in the laboratory without any animal product whatsoever. No animal product, no blood, nothing at all. And it tastes just like regular veal. Would you call it vegetarian? Usko shakahari bolenge ya mansahari bolenge? The questions that we need to, the society will have to address. We have a lot of bacteria in our body. Bacteria can be used, made to, as, a, as a drug to drink it. That's a living form. Would you like to call it vegetarian? Non-vegetarian. So the whole foundation of society is going to be unruffled with this new technology. You know, as I said, now that you can make your own shoes, there are 3D softwares available that will make a 3D image, and then go to the 3D printer. Printer can be bought at 400, and it can print in a fraction of a minute. So you can print your own shoe every now and then. You don't have to go to the shopping mall. So what will happen to the cobbler, cobbling profession? I don't know. What will happen to the construction industry? I don't know. That's where society is going to be seriously impaired, seriously wondering, where are we heading? Today there's an app, you can do a Google on your, on your smartphone, go for app Moody's. Once you go to the app Moody's and download it, it can tell you which mood you are in. Good mood, bad mood. I want to go and meet my boss. All he has to do is to open the map app and, and take a picture of him and say, which mood is he in? Oh, he's in bad mood. Oh, I will not talk much about it. That's happening. That's actually happening. In a few years, 
apps will read your facial expression. In fact, the iPhone XX, just two weeks from now it will be released, and I do hope to get my first one. <laughs> I'm an Apple addict. So app, Apple X actually can read your 3D facial expression. People say, no, no, it doesn't matter. If you're sleeping, I can take it and get to know open your iPhone. No, you cannot. Because it has captured the 3D of different postures and made up a print of yours. If you're sleeping, you, go, you will go only get one version. When I open it, you have all kinds of image, all kinds of muscles moving around. And that's what it captures. So it takes your expression. And once you have an app which can also tell you, and that's not very far. Am I lying or am I telling the truth? So which means the political debates of tomorrow will change completely. A politician comes on the stage and says, my ear kardunga, wo kardunga. I have to go, rude word. You cannot do all that. Perhaps common man will not have to wait for five years now to know that whether Achidin will come or will not come. So to conclude, 20, 30 years from now, or maybe 10, 20 years from now, computers will do many things you and me cannot do, and they will do much more intelligently. So where will be human being? Where, what will be our role? We will have to focus things that the computers cannot do. And what are those things? Still there are plenty of things that the computer will perhaps never be able to do, such as creativity and innovation. Remember, these are all products of data. So you need data. And creating and innovation comes naturally. And that's where the computers will not be able to do it faster the way you can do it, the way we can do it. Team sports, playing in the ground, enjoying, running, jogging, thinking, thinking in different tone, crying. These things computers will not be able to do. Human values and beliefs value to respect elders, value to respect the society. These things computers will not be able to do. And most importantly, compassion and empathy. And that's where I think the world has a future. And finally, the feeling of love, loving an individual. Love is just a word until someone comes in your life and brings in happiness. That is something computers will never be able to do. It.